Good afternoon. I'm Serena Collado, Director of Community Health at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset. Welcome to today's webinar on a heart to heart on the cardiac impacts of COVID-19 presented in collaboration with Friends Health Connection. Nearly a quarter of individuals hospitalized with COVID-19 have been diagnosed with cardiovascular complications, according to the American Heart Association. Cardiovascular complications also contribute to about 40% of COVID-19 deaths. During today's webinar, we will talk more about the effects of COVID-19 on the heart and why COVID-19 is such a risk for people with pre-existing heart conditions. We will also discuss strategies for preventing both COVID-19 and heart disease. Today, we are joined by our special guest, Dr. Rajita Sengupta, a cardiologist with Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset. So we will begin today's webinar with 20 minutes of a moderated discussion followed by questions from our audience. So welcome all and welcome Dr. Sangupta. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's begin with you telling our audience a little bit about yourself. Good afternoon and thank you Serena for such a warm welcome. I enjoy doing this every year. Uh, Serena has been very, very uh, welcoming every year in letting me kick off the heart month with uh, the webinar talk. And we had a discussion just before this, what should we talk about this year? And the first thing that came to my mind was COVID uh, because COVID has taken such a toll on us in the last nine months. And I don't know for how long this is going to continue. As a cardiologist where I'm dealing with COVID patients day in, day out, I am so happy to be part of this program. Um, as many of you know from uh, the names that I see among the, amongst the participants, uh, I am a cardiologist in uh, Somerset County. I uh, practice at Robert Wood Johnson Somerset, also at New Brunswick, uh, and my practice is in Bridgewater with the Cardiology Associates of Somerset County with my wonderful, excellent partners, Dr. Shivang Trivedi and Dr. Alexander Ivanov. I'm also an assistant professor at uh, Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, where I teach about uh, once a week. And uh, that has been a new phase of my life uh, since last year, and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I am so happy to be part of this program today, and I welcome all of you, and I hope that you go home well-informed about COVID-19, not be scared about it, but well-prepared to fight it. Well, great, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, that with us and telling us a little bit about yourself. So as we mentioned, people who have COVID-19 may experience heart disease and cardiovascular complications. So can you tell us more about the effect of COVID-19 on the heart? What types of complications can cause it? Sure, uh, uh, Serena, if you can allow me to share the screen sure. uh, as I have some slides because pictures speak a thousand words in my mind. Okay, so I made you a co-host. Do, um, do you have the ability to share? Uh, let me just see that. No, I think you have to make me the host. Okay. Hold on. In order to do that. Okay, go ahead. Let's see. I'm going to try and see if we can share screen. And if we can't, maybe you can just, um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to share um, on the webinar, but if you can, would you be able to speak to that? Yes, I should be able to speak to that and you'll be able to see me, but I'm trying to see so that, you know, the participants can also see the screen, which will be, I think, really helpful for them too. Um, you made me the host, right? Yeah. I'm not seeing any place to share. So maybe in the interest of time, maybe we can just- I'm just going to go ahead with it. Yeah, maybe you can just talk to it. So okay. again, and, and again here, I was just asking about, if you could t just tell us about the effects of sure. COVID on the heart and what types of complications can cause it. Right, and if anybody's interested, I will share the slides with Serena and you can upload it on the website just so that you have these uh, information. So just a little bit about, um, in very simple terms, what the coronavirus does to the cardiovascular system. 
Um, I'm going to include some medical terms in there, but I'm going to try to explain it as I go along, just so that you understand what it means. So the primary effect we see in patients with severe coronavirus infection is patients can present with hypotension or low blood pressure, tachycardia or fast heart rate, or bradycardia or slow heart rate. They can have different kinds of arrhythmias. And one of the most fatal complications we have seen in our patients is sudden cardiac death. These are the immediate effects of severe coronavirus infection. However, there is also something called significant secondary comorbidity where patients who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease that puts them at higher risk of adverse events with the infection than with patients without any pre-existing cardiovascular disease. The viral infection in turn may contribute to chronic unstable conditions of the existing condition. For example, if a patient has congestive heart failure and they are infected with coronavirus infection, that may destabilize their compensated state of the congestive heart failure and make them go into acute congestive heart failure. The suggested mechanisms in the first situation where we see patients presenting acutely with low blood pressure, fast heart rate, slow heart rate, and even sudden cardiac death is there has been some association with the receptor called ACE2, which is also expressed in the heart, and also a lot of cytokines or inflammatory biomarkers. In coronavirus, this has been a primary feature in what it produces in the cardiovascular system or generally inside the whole body. Your body goes into like an inflammatory storm. So think of your body being swollen, inflamed, red all over inside, and that is also affecting your cardiovascular system. That leads to acute situations where patients present with shock, they present with acute heart attacks, and also with sudden cardiac death. Also, this kind of systemic inflammation leads to one of the most dangerous complications that we worry about, what we call as coronary plaque rupture. Plaque is something that builds up in our heart and happens from as early as 12 years of age. But as we grow older, the plaque formation increases. Just like, like we have plaque on our teeth, we go to our dentist and have it cleaned out. We have plaque formation in our heart also. Unfortunately, we don't have a cardiac hygienist who can go in and clean those plaque out. So some people have more plaque, some people have less plaque, and depending on your plaque formation, that leads to ultimately blockage of your coronary arteries or what we call coronary artery disease. When we have significant inflammation in our body, what happens to these plaques is they become unstable, they rupture, and that can cause an acute heart attack. The other complication we have seen in coronavirus patients is because of this pro-inflammatory state and because of all these inflammatory markers circulating in our body, it increases this chance of stent thrombosis. For example, if I have a stent in my body and I have severe coronavirus infection, I have a high risk of closing up my stent or what we call stent thrombosis. So the other thing that we see in our patients with SARS-CoV-2 is because of severe hypoxia or low oxygen in the blood and inflammation, that leads to a lot of clot formation or what we call thrombosis in the body that can result in several manifestations in the acute form. Patients can present with acute heart attack. The medical term you must have heard is called myocardial infarction, but we call it an acute heart attack. It can also present with what we call stress cardiomyopathy. Stress from all the inflammatory biomarkers. Cardio means mus heart, myo means muscle, and pathy means pathology or disease. In this kind of patients, we see patients having normal blood flow in the coronary vessels, but their heart 
starts to loosen their pumping action. Normally, our pumping action or the ejection fraction is about 55% and above. In these kind of patients, we see acutely their pumping action dropping down to as low as 10 to 15%. If patients recover, we have seen miracles happen where the cardiac function recovers with the help of some miracle drugs like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Another thing that we see in our patients with SARS-CoV-2 is we call myocarditis. Myo, muscle, cardi is heart, itis means inflammation. So what myocarditis means that the muscles of the heart are severely, severely inflamed, okay? So it's just like if you go and exercise in a gym after a long time and your muscles are sore and they are hurting. So same thing, your heart muscles are sore and they are hurting, they are inflamed. You're not able to even walk down the stairs because your muscles are so sore. You're not able to lift your shoulders your muscles are so sore from all that workout. Same thing happening in the heart. Just imagine your heart is the size of your fist. So all the muscles in that heart is severely inflamed and hardly able to pump. And because of that, the heart is not able to be able to pump. That leads to poor blood supply and the patients can present with hypoxia, present hypotension or low blood pressure and uh, arrhythmias. Once more, uh, I'm just going to go over the possible symptoms that present, patients can present with that you should be aware of and the possible complications. So one of the most common symptoms we see is chest pain. Um, there is uh, irregular heartbeat or arrhythmia. And when patients come into uh, the hospital, we do an EKG that we test for whether patients having acute heart attack or any other kind of arrhythmias. We also see a significant level of troponin in the blood. Some people of you, um, some people must be aware of that term. It is a um, cardiac biomarker that is released when the heart muscle sustains injury. Injury could be from a heart attack, from the myopathy or the weakened muscle, or from the myocarditis or the inflammation of the heart muscle. So in a nutshell, the coronavirus, again, because of that inflammatory property, causes the complications like inflammation of the cardiac muscle, decreased blood flow in the coronary arteries. There are blood clots because of, remember, the thrombosis of, because of the inflammation. Blood clots can form in the veins of the legs, in the groin or the arm, and sometimes even in our stents. Patients can often present with cardiogenic shock in severe cases where the heart cannot pump enough blood to the vital organs, ultimately leading to heart failure and death. Some of the common other symptoms that you should be aware of and should not be ignoring your heart symptoms, especially if you have a heart condition, if you have any kind of shortness of breath that is getting worse, dizziness, chronic lack of energy, Irregular heartbeat, chest discomfort or pain, fainting or blackouts. If you have any facial drooping where you see certain part of the face, it looks different from the other side. Any arm weakness or any speech difficulty. It may be nothing, but it could be your heart. So don't delay calling your doctor. We are always available 24 by 7 because that's our job. <laughs> so Dr. Sam Gupta, just to clarify, so this, these are conditions that kind of mitigate after having COVID-19. So nobody, somebody doesn't necessarily have to have a pre-existing condition, correct? This is some of the, the conditions or complications they can get after COVID-19. Is that what, is that the, is right. that the understanding? Right. But people who are, as I said in the beginning, people can have the cardiovascular symptoms even without any pre-existing condition. But people with pre-existing condition, they can have this in a more severe form. Correct. So people with or people who already have a stent, people who have a known diagnosis of heart failure, people who have had a stroke in the past, people with diabetics. I'm going to go over the risk factors a little bit later, people who are more prone to severe symptoms, but they are the people who are at much higher risk of having all these symptoms, but in a more severe form. 
Okay, thank you for clarifying that. So then should people who have had COVID-19 get screened for heart uh, issues? Yes, definitely. So if you have recovered from COVID-19, um, and uh, thank God for that, and uh, please make sure that if you have any kind of cardiac conditions, like if you had a stent in the past, if you had a stroke in the past, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, if you're a smoker, if you're a diabetic, you should definitely go seek a medical attention, either with your primary care doctor or with your cardiologist. Make sure that you are taking care of your heart because sometimes what happens in COVID-19, if you, once you're recovered or you're discharged from the hospital, your symptoms may linger a little bit longer. Now, it may be just a normal recovery process from the COVID-19, but it could mean something else. So don't ignore your symptoms. If you have persistent symptoms and if you have any underlying pre-existing cardiac conditions, please, please, please go see your cardiologist or your primary care for further evaluation because better be safe than sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you. That's great advice. Um, so, you no, know, Dr. Singhupta, you had mentioned earlier that you know people with pre-existing heart conditions are more at risk um, for serious complications. Um, again, can you explain why those people with pre-existing um, heart conditions are more at risk? Is it the inflammation factor, or um, can you go into a little bit more on that? Sure. So, uh, just remember when patients have a cardiovascular condition. The reason that patient has a cardiovascular condition is because of their risk factors, right? So a patient who is a smoker, a diabetic, a patient who is, has significant family history of heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, any kind of vascular disease, the reason they have that condition is because there is some kind of inflammation in the body. Now, this term inflammation is very new in the medical literature. And just to give you a little background, a little background beyond the COVID-19, we now know why patients present to us with acute heart attacks, stroke, stents, um, because of inflammation in their body. There are several causes of inflammation, a lot of research is going on for that. And it's still kind of a little bit of a gray area, but we definitely know that inflammation plays a vital role in this pre-existing conditions to begin with. So if I have some kind of inflammation already in my body that makes me prone to these kind of cardiovascular conditions, just imagine I get the coronavirus infection and that creates what we call a cytokine storm like inflammation is exploding in my body versus I don't have any existing inflammation in my body. I am healthy. I don't have any pre-existing cardiovascular conditions and I have this cytokine storm. So the level of inflammation that goes up in patients with pre-existing conditions is almost in an exponential manner in comparison to a person without any pre-existing disease. Hence, the disease is more severe in these kind of patients, and that's why we request them to seek earlier medical attention, and they need to be treated much more aggressively than other patients who can be treated as an outpatient. I hope I'm clear with that. Yeah, yeah. So um, now we know COVID-19 has also contributed in another indirect way to increased heart complications. Um, many people with heart disease are trying to stay at home and socially distant to prevent getting the virus, but they're also putting off seeing their doctors and avoiding care at hospitals. So again, why might that be considered dangerous? That's a great question. And you are 100% right. And there, are, there has been increasing concern about patients and specifically older adults who are sitting at home afraid to come out seek medical attention, even see their doctor go to a hospital um, because of uh, the uh, fear of getting the COVID-19. Um, so many older adults fearful of COVID-19, are, they are strictly adhering to social isolation measures. And the sad part is they may be avoiding routine medical care. 
So continued management of cardiac disease during this pandemic is essential. And I stress on this word essential as optimization of cardiovascular health, because it may not only decrease the risk of a cardiac admission, but potentially mitigate the vulnerability of exposure to SARS-CoV-2. Um, if patients are canceling appointments, um, ACC, which is American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, they are encouraging us as physicians and physician offices to contact our patients to avoid canceling appointments, encourage them to schedule a visit either via telehealth if possible. Older adults may have difficulty navigating with audiovisual technology. We all know that even we have problem with that. Look at what happened today. We couldn't even share the screen. So patients and families should be encouraged to familiarize themselves with the video platform to which they have access and feel comfortable using. Um, and if not, we can always do the visit over the phone uh, so that uh, we can guide you whether you need more um, testing, more blood work, or if you're not feeling well, whether you should be going into the hospital. So, um, you know, we, and as physicians and physicians offices, we have set up several guidelines where we are trying to see our patients uh, during this pandemic so that they should not be scared of coming to their doctor's offices. They should not um, postpone their doctor's of, the office visits or cancel their appointments. We are taking safeguarding measures. Uh, which are reiterated every opportunity. And uh, we are also trying to do direct encounters with high risk older, older patients. And um, we are also making sure that all relevant guideline directed medications are being continued in the absence of contraindications. Uh, patients who have COVID and if they are being treated at home, they should also reach out to their doctors because sometimes some of the medications you are taking could interact with your regular medications. So please contact your doctor if you are taking any cardiovascular medications and you're being treated at home um, for possible COVID-19. The importance of maintaining nutrition, hydration, exercise, despite social isolation measures need to be emphasized. And uh, that is our role as physicians um, towards these patients. Um, older adults should be instructed to identify a healthy, low risk trusted point of contact with uh, whom uh, your physicians can maintain communication. Um, and last but not the least, you may, if you are postponing your doctor's visit for fear of getting COVID-19, you may be putting your health at a more higher risk than not seeing your doctor. Okay. So you touched upon some of these things, but for people with heart disease, what do you recommend they do to help prevent uh, getting COVID-19? So this virus is very new to us. And you know, um, when it first came to the US or even when we first got introduced to it from China, nobody knew what could prevent it, right? Then came the mask, the hand washing, washing your groceries, washing your any, any surface contact. And as time, and, has, as time has evolved, we now know the predominant mode of transmission of this infection is by aerosols which is any kind of droplet that could be coming from your mouth or from your nostrils. So at the present time, the only way of preventing getting an infection is wear a mask, hand hygiene, and social distancing. There are specific guidelines that have been set up by state, um, that is avoid indoor gatherings, not more than 10 people, avoid outdoor gatherings. For the elderly people, when I see them or I talk to them over telehealth, I always advise them that to make sure they are wearing a mask, doing hand washing and uh, practicing social distancing when they are in contact or in close contact with others. These have been the established methods of preventing um, the infection. There has been no approved medication uh, by the FDA to prevent infection by the COVID-19 virus. There has been several trials that has happened with medications like uh, chloroquine, uh, colchicine, and uh, also a new drug called ivermectin, which is an anti-parasite drug, but it has not been approved by FDA because of no real benefit. And remember, all medications have side effects. So if the FDA is not approving it, uh, we are not allowed to prescribe it off-label and uh, because of obviously uh, no benefit and possible interaction with other medications.
patients. So currently, the only way of preventing the spread of the COVID-19 and to prevent yourself from getting the infection is mask, 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 wash, 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 social distance, social distance, social distance. Yeah, we call that here at the hospital four W's. Um, wear your mask, wash your hands regularly, watch your distance, and when you're sick, stay home. So thank, thank you. Um, now, exactly. you talked a little bit about prevention. So let's talk about the vaccine. Is the COVID-19 vaccine safe for somebody with a heart condition? I'm a living proof. I'm still alive. <laughs> so I take it that answer is yes. That it is yes, 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 definitely yes, yes. So uh, just a little bit about the vaccine. It is um, it's a very new vaccine to us, but the technology is not new. Okay. So a uh, little bit background with vaccines. You know, we all get our flu shots. So what the flu shot is is a little bit of the live flu virus that is given in our body and our body. Uh, produces immunity against it. It doesn't really prevent you from getting the flu, but what it does is if you get the flu, you'll get a milder version of the flu. The same concept with the vaccine. The vaccine that we currently have available, approved by FDA, and we are giving to our patients are two mRNA vaccine. So what is an mRNA? An mRNA is a part of a little little molecule within the coronavirus and what we do is a similar mRNA is manufactured genetically. It is coated in a lipid molecule or a lot of fatty molecule to protect that little molecule uh, from degradation by the body's normal uh, mechanism. And then what we do is we inject it into a cell and that creates spike proteins. The spike proteins are similar to the protein that is on the surface of the coronavirus. So when we inject this mRNA into a vaccinated cell, it produces the spike proteins. The spike proteins in turn causes a marshal of immunity cells in our body, T cells, B cells, and killer T cells. So when I get infected with a coronavirus, my T cells, my B cells, my killer T cells recognizes those spike proteins on the coronavirus and is able to attack it and destroy it. So my risk of getting a severe coronavirus infection is low. It doesn't prevent me from getting the coronavirus infection, but I will not get severe disease. So that's the whole idea of the vaccine. Currently, there are two vaccines that are approved. As I said, one is the Pfizer and one is the Moderna. Both are two doses for the Pfizer. Uh, the two doses are three weeks apart. For the Moderna, it is about four weeks apart. Both have been shown to be about 95% effective in preventing severe disease. There are some new strains that are out um, in this world now, the strain from South Africa and the strain from UK. New data is coming out that um, both of them are effective in preventive uh, severe disease from both these strains. There are also several other vaccines that are uh, being used in the rest of the world. Um, but as of now, these are the two vaccines approved in the US. Um, and there is a third one that is coming out uh, from J&J, uh, hopefully in a month or so. Uh, some of the side effects that you may expect from this vaccine are injection site reactions, some fatigue, some headache, muscle pain, uh, chills, joint pain, and fever. Usually the second dose gives you a little bit more side effects, but uh, they go away within 24 to 48 hours. Um, the vaccine is very safe uh, about already a lot of people have received it. There has been very low incidence of severe allergic reactions. People have has had the side effects, some more, some little less, but no real serious adverse effects um, have been reported. So I highly, highly, highly encourage all of you to take the vaccine because that's the only way we can get this pandemic under control. If you've had COVID-19 COVID infection, you have to wait for 90 days, nine zero days after your diagnosis. That's when you become eligible to get the vaccine. But 
everybody needs to get vaccinated. Unfortunately, we are uh, still in the in the one phase where only the 1A, 1B, 1C people are uh, eligible for the vaccine. Uh, 1A are the healthcare workers, 1B are the uh, first responders. Now, uh, 1C are the first responders. 1B is where some of our general population comes into play. And this is where I'm going to talk a little about, about what your pre-existing condition makes you qualify. So individuals aged 65 and older and individuals aged 16 to 64 with medical conditions as defined by the Centers for Disease Control, which um, who are at high risk because of their pre-existing condition. These conditions are any kind of cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, or which is a lung condition, people with Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, or if you've had stents in the past, or cardiomyopathies, or you have a weakened heart muscle. Obesity with a body mass index of more than 30 kilogram per meter square or higher. Severe obesity, where you have a BMI of more than 40 kilogram per meter square. Sickle cell disease, smoking, and diabetes. So if you have any of these conditions and you are aged between 16 to 64, that makes you eligible for the vaccine as of now. There is a website. It is called uh, https colon backslash covidvaccine.nj.gov. Please make sure that you guys go and pre-register for the vaccine and give your cell phone and email in there because that way they know that you have, you have what, whether you qualify in the uh, 1A1B1C criteria, they'll be getting uh, back to you as soon as they have vaccine supply available. Um, I encourage everyone to go ahead, go ahead and get the vaccine because we need to get rid of this pandemic. And the only way we can do this is by getting vaccinated. More and more people can get vaccinated. We can develop the herd immunity and we can get back to our normal lives, which we all are ready for. Yes, absolutely. So what are some general tips then for keeping your heart healthy and preventing heart disease in the meantime? You know, I know everybody's going to, you know, everybody's going to rush off and, and sign up today if they haven't already. And, you know, and they will get back to you. Um, so just please be patient. But in the meantime, if you could give us some general tips, that would be really sure. helpful. Sure. So COVID-19 has really taken a big toll on our general routine. You know, we are home, we cannot hit the gym, um, we cannot go to the grocery store as much because this, there's this fear of what if we contract inf infection from there. But what I tell my patient and what I try to do for myself is do your best, whatever you can with the current situation. Because at this point, we don't know when the pandemic is going to end. We don't know what is coming, but do your best within your means. Uh, one of the first things is physical activity. You know that physical activity is a great way to put, help protect your heart from heart disease and stroke. Keep your heart healthy and aim for at least two and a half hours of moderate physical activity every week. Uh, I tell my patients that try to do at least half an hour, six days a week or one hour, three days a week. Um, sometimes doing heart healthy activities with a friend will keep both of you inspired for the long run. A friend can be your spouse, your kids, or nowadays Zoom is our best friend. You know, uh, me and my friends, we actually work out on Zoom and uh, some of the things that you can do is take an online fitness class together like yoga, uh, come into a walking schedule with a friend or a family member if you enjoy outdoors, try to go biking, uh, do some gardening essentially protect your heart by moving more and get your family and friends to do the same. Uh, one of the other things is uh, diet, to get a heart healthy uh, life by following uh, healthy dietary uh, guidelines. One of this is called the DASH diet, uh, which uh, requires no special foods. It, uh, it just gives, you can go online and look it up. It is uh, just look up DASH diet and they have healthy recipes to try. You can make a grocery list. And then go get, get your grocery stuff, groceries from the store, cook heart healthy uh, versions of family favorites, and of course, enjoy the meals you prepared. Uh, try to avoid too much of uh, high carbohydrate diet, 
uh, try to avoid too much of animal protein. There has been more and more data and research coming out that animal protein um, causes a lot of inflammation in your body. Uh, I myself have uh, become a totally plant-based uh, uh, physician. I advertise myself as a plant-based cardiologist uh, because we know that we can get enough protein from a plant-based diet. So uh, try to limit your animal protein as much as possible. It's hard, you know, this is America. We all believe in where's the meat. Um, so it will be hard to give it up completely, but try to limit as much as possible. Dairy also, uh, a little bit less. I try to switch to like almond milk, oatmeal, those kind of natural sources of dairy and um, exercise along with diet uh, goes a long way. A um, couple of things um, of, about self-care ideas. Make sure that you take a moment to de-stress. Um, it is very, very important to de-stress yourself as, you, as the more you stress, your body builds up more inflammation and more inflammation leads to more coronary artery disease, more stroke, more high blood pressure, and uh, other uh, bad cardiovascular uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, yoga is a great way to de-stress yourself. Uh, I myself am I'm a big proponent of yoga. Uh, I'm of Indian origin, so I grew up learning yoga, but as a kid, I probably didn't value it as much. But now, uh, as I'm older and I'm seeing that, you know, sometimes my joints hurt after a long day, my back hurts, yoga has been a life-changing thing for me. There is more and more data coming out on yoga and cardiovascular health, and it has been shown that yoga has excellent benefits on patients with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. It helps in prevention of developing cardiovascular disease and helps to get diabetes under control. You do not have to do those tough asanas or position in yoga. You can do a lot of beginner yoga with like simple stretches, simple breathing techniques, which is available everywhere on YouTube. Uh, try those out. It's an excellent, excellent way to de-stress yourself. And there's no particular time to do yoga. You can even do yoga before you go to bed. Sometimes after a busy day, I do yoga just before I go to bed for like 10 minutes. And then you will sleep better and you will see the more you do every day, it has a definite positive effect. Last but not the least, I would like to stress on one important thing uh, that is very, very important for cardiovascular patient is smoke free. If you are smoking, quit today. Smoking is like poisoning your heart you are committing self-poisoning to your body by every puff of smoke that you take. The unfortunate part of smoking is every time you take a puff of smoke, you're causing more and more damage and inflammation to your body. And unfortunately, that damage or inflammation is irreversible. But the minute you stop smoking, that damage or that inflammation stops. Smokers are up to four times more likely to develop heart disease or to have a stroke compared to non-smokers, but it pays to quit. Just one year after quitting, your heart attack risk drops sharply. Ask your family and friends for support or joining. Ask your doctor to help. You know, ask your family and friends who are smokers or co-workers who are smokers that you are quitting and you want their help. Ask them not to smoke around you. They might follow your lead. Research has shown that people are much more likely to quit if their spouse, friend, or sibling starts smoking. So if you did not hear any part of my talk today, I just want you to remember just this one thing. You smoke, it is my ardent request, quit today. Thank you. Thank you for those helpful hips, uh, tips, excuse me. So now let's say somebody, you know, obviously they, need some assistance, they, they're having some heart issues. Um, you know, we have some services here at Robert Wood Johnson Somerset. So what are the cardiac diagnostic and treatment options available at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset? Sure. So if you are admitted in the hospital with COVID-19, obviously uh, we do so do some basic checkups on our heart, but 
if you've had COVID-19 or you just want to be screened for cardiovascular disease in general, uh, Robert Wood Johnson um, Hospital offers uh, all the kinds of cardiovascular testing, uh, which can also be done at your outpatient doctor's offices. Uh, my office offers a full-fledged service also. We do EKGs at the hospital. Uh, we do echocardiograms, which is like an ultrasound of the heart, where we put a little gel on your chest and we take pictures of the heart muscle, the valves, the chambers of the heart. I tell my patients, an echocardiogram is like checking the structure of your heart. So if you imagine your house, you have the house with different rooms, different um, doors, windows. So the echocardiogram, what it does, it is checking whether your doors and windows are opening and closing properly. Are your rooms the right size? Are the walls of the room uh, showing any changes? So that's what an echocardiogram shows. We also do stress tests, which is a functional assessment of how much your blood flow is happening in your heart and whether you have enough blood flow, whether you are having or showing signs, whether you have a, a blockage happening, any plaque build up. We also offer a test called coronary CTA, which is a CAT scan of the heart that tells us whether you have any early plaque build up. It is also telling you whether you have any high calcium score that makes you at high risk uh, for developing heart disease in the future. And also we offer uh, cardiac angiography or catheterization where we look for actual blockages, put in stents along with angioplasty. Uh, we offer uh, full-fledged EP services. Um, uh, my partner, Dr. Ivanov, is uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, EP procedure generating a person in the hospital. He does uh, pacemakers, he does um, a loop recorders, which is like a little device that we can put in the chest when patients having any kind of arrhythmias. Sometimes Holter monitors or event recorders that we do from the hospital may not be able to pick it up. Loop recorder is like a small chip that goes inside your chest that can stay in your body for up to three years, but that is recording your heart rhythm 24 by seven. Uh, also, we do cardiac angiography. As I said, me and my partner, Dr. Kribeli, we operate in the hospital as several other invasive cardiologists. Uh, where you come into the hospital, we put in a tiny IV, either in your groin or your right wrist. Um, and through that, we are able to pass a little wire and a catheter that goes up all the way in the heart. Then you put dye in the heart arteries and take pictures and find out whether you have any blockages in here or not. If there's a blockage, we can fix it right then and there with the balloon and a stent. Um, and uh, we also offer other diagnostic procedures called transesophageal echo, which is almost like a cardiac endoscopy where we put a tube down your food tube, take pictures of the heart to look at your valves, whether you have any blood clots or anything like that. So a host of services, um, everything is available uh, at the hospital and our outpatient office. And just remember, never hesitate to ask for help. We are doctors. When we took our oath, we took the oath helping our patients, and that's our job. So never hesitate to talk to your doctor or call us. Thank, thank you for sharing that with us. So um, at this time, I'd actually like to open it up to questions from our audience. And um, if you have a question for Dr. Sam Gupta, please post it in our question and answer uh, section of our um, webinar, and I'll be happy to um, ask her those. So I think one of the questions there was that, uh, I think you touched base, but um, can those who have heart disease get the coronavirus? And you answered yes, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, another question from our, um, one of our audience members um, was, I wonder if um, telemedicine appointments are appropriate for cardiology patients or should they always be one-on-one -on -one appointments? Great question. Telemedicine is not the same as one-on-one -on -one appointment, but just understand that something is better than nothing. At this point, we're in a pandemic, right? I have patients who are like 99 years old, 100, I have a 103-year-old actually, that's my oldest in my practice. And sometimes it's hard for them to come out. And now in the winter time, look at the weather with the snow and everything. But at least if on telemedicine, I have a visit with them, I can look at the salient features and like if they're having any swelling in the legs. Like for example, the other day, my 96 year old called me that she has swelling in the legs and she was able to show me on her phone that her legs are all puffed up. 
And then I prescribed some water bill on her and I got a message from her three days later, my legs look beautiful, okay? So these are some things. And you know, if she did not, if that patient did not call me or did not set up a televisit, it, she may have ended up having even more worse complications from it. So at this point, what we're trying to say is, if you're comfortable coming to the doctor's office, if you're able to come to the doctor's office, that's much better. We obviously are okay with that and we are taking necessary precautions for that. But if you are unable to come visit your doctor or you are not comfortable, please, please, please at least do a telemedicine visit for a follow-up just to make sure you're doing okay and uh, for all the medications you're taking, if there's any change in medications and uh, any other questions you may have for your doctor. Um, so we have uh, um, some more questions coming in. Um, this is a very um, good question. Does somebody under 65 but with a hypercoagulable disorder qualify for early vaccine? Um, are, there, um, are they at greater risk? Uh, yes. So a uh, patient with hypercoagulable state. So what that means is that their body has either some kind of genetic disorder where they are prone to clot formation. Usually these kind of patients are on a blood thinner, but some are not. It depends on what kind of condition you have. Um, and that is a question for a hemato hematologist, which I hope you are um, following through. Um, so if you are on a blood thinner, then your risk of forming a blood clot or thrombosis is low. But if you are not, and you should definitely talk to your hematologist about it. Regarding the vaccine, definitely if you are in that, um, if you are in um, that age range of 16 to 64, I would definitely talk to your hematologist, get their opinion whether uh, you will fit in the criteria of the vaccine. I kind of went over the criteria by CDC guidelines but there are other criteria that patients fall under and they can well be eligible um, for the vaccine. Okay, thank you. So another question, do you know the incidence of cardiovascular complications in young adults or children post COVID-19? So in young adults, the incidence and in children, the incidence of uh, COVID-19 is low. Now, does that mean we haven't seen any patients, any young adults uh, with COVID-19 with uh, bad complications? Yes, we have seen younger patients getting affected, some with even severe disease, uh, if they have any pre-existing conditions. One of the most important pre-existing condition we found in um, young adults was obesity. And actually we saw it uh, in a lot of our physician colleagues also who got affected by it, where obesity played a big role. Now, the pathophysiology or the mechanism why obesity causes this kind of complications is not known, but in obese people, there has been known to have problems in their lung aeration. And because COVID-19 affects mainly the lung tissue in obese patients, there may be a reason why they have a more severe form of the disease and they can succumb to this kind of illness. In the pediatric population, again, we are seeing a little less incidence, so that's why the vaccine is only approved. Uh, the Pfizer is approved from 16 and above and the Moderna is from 18 and above. Because the incidence has been so low, uh, the pediatric population has not been tested. It's currently under trial, uh, but they do get it, but the incidence is much, much, much lower than um, in the uh, adult population. Okay, thank you. These are all great questions coming in from the audience. So here's another. If somebody has a cardiovascular disease or a lung disease and mm -hmm. has had COVID-19, could they contract COVID-19 again? Yes. So what we are seeing now, and again, remember this vaccine is very new and as time goes on, we are, finding out more and more about this vaccine. So uh, if you have had COVID in the past and you've recovered, all right, doesn't mean that you're protected forever. Same thing applies to this vaccine. We don't know yet how long the vaccine protects us. Only time will tell and only more data will help. 
So if you have had, had COVID-19 in the past, please, please, please continue the masking, the social distancing, and the hand washing, the four W's that Serena talked about, because not only are you at risk of developing the infection again, and you can have severe complications from it. The issue is how long is your antibodies or the protective proteins that your body develops from the infection last in your body? Nobody knows how long. Same thing when, you, when, you, when we are given the vaccine, we don't know how long these antibodies last in our body. They're saying few months, we may need a booster shot. At this point, we don't know. But at this point, because there is the pandemic is still going on, we still have to do the four W's. We can only stop the masking, the uh, social distancing and hand washing when the pandemic is over, which means that the incidence of COVID-19 in the general population is very, very low because your heart immunity level is high. Until and unless we achieve that, even if you've had COVID-19 infection in the past, you can still get COVID-19 infection again. So as long as the pandemic is on, mask, 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 social distance, social distance, social distance, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. Okay. Um, here's another question. Is there any difference seen in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 that have a controlled cardiovascular condition, like taking medication, versus patients who have a pre-existing condition, but they were not taking any meds? Excellent question. And I would say this applies not only to COVID-19, but with any other patho pathological disease we see. For example, let's take the example of diabetes, okay? We have a patient with controlled diabetes, good A1C, and a patient with uncontrolled diabetes. COVID-19, obviously, in the uncontrolled diabetes can take a very severe form. Same thing in a patient who has diabetes uncontrolled versus controlled, any kind of disease, whether it can be any kind of infection, whether it is a heart attack or a stroke, can take severe form in an uncontrolled disease state versus a controlled disease state, okay? So again, going back to your question with cardiovascular disease, so if I have a patient who has congestive heart failure that is controlled, who takes medications regularly, weighs himself, uh, watches his salt intake, is, in, is able to exercise with good exercise tolerance, the chances of him or her having severe COVID is much lower than a patient who, who decides to take his medication whenever he feels like, doesn't weigh himself, doesn't watch his salt. So this, this aspect of control disease versus uncontrolled disease applies not only to COVID, but any other disease scenario. So the answer is yes. If you have any kind of uncontrolled cardiovascular conditions, you are prone to more severe complications from COVID. Wow, great. And I know one of the last questions was, if um, our audience is um, interested in reaching out to you, um, how can they go about doing that? You can, um, uh, my practice is Cardiology Associates of Somerset County. You can Google me, um, my name, Sen Gupta, cardiologist. Uh, my information is all over the internet and I am taking new patients. I'll be very, very happy to take care of you. Uh, my practice is known for uh, quality care. Uh, me and my partners, Dr. Trivedi and Dr. Ivanov, we spend a lot of time with our patients because we treat our patients like family. I take care of my patients just like I would take care of my father, mother, brother, sister. So welcome to, you are welcome anytime to uh, call us and set up an appointment and I'll be more than happy to help. Great, well, thank you for joining us today. Um, you gave us a ton of great information. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, that I don't see any additional questions. So um, this will actually conclude today's webinar. Please remember that the opinions expressed here by our medical experts are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. If you need a physician, please call our physician referral line at 1-888-724-7123. And for more information about Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital Somerset, please visit our website at www.rwjbh.org.
backslash Somerset. So once again, thank you, Dr. Sengupta, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Please remember the four W's, wear your mask, wash your hands regularly, watch your distance, and when you're sick, stay home. Please be safe, and if you get the opportunity to get the vaccination, take your shot. Um, have a great day. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you for joining, and please take care of yourself. Bye. Bye.